Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we're back again. Uh, we had some technological difficulties earlier, and consequently, a number of people could hear and could not hear, or whatever the case may be. So we decided to come back on at three o'clock instead of our one o'clock time. And certainly we appreciate anybody's presence who was on the earlier show. We certainly appreciate you chiming in with us on this second show as a result of the technological difficulties that we had earlier in the show. We have an interesting subject today. Uh, the subject is called the offense trap. This is a very, very important subject when it comes to the whole notion of new self-forgiveness. And we certainly understand the depth of this subject because there are millions of people who are estranged from very significant people in their lives because of the offense trap. And so one of the things that we are trying to do is give us an understanding of what happens when a person is not forgiving or does not forgive another person. And what we have to understand is that the Bible says in Proverbs chapter four, verse number seven, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom, but with all of thy getting, get an understanding. And so what I've been trying to do in the last few shows in the month of March, which is dealing with new self forgiveness, is not only to point out things about non-forgiveness and unforgiveness and what forgiveness really is, but helping people to understand what take place behind the scene to help us to get a grasp on this whole concept of forgiveness and non-forgiveness. And so today we're gonna to be talking about the subject, the offense trap, the offense trap. And we're gonna be taking our subject from the passage in Matthew chapter 24, verses 10 through 14. So let's go right into that right now and uh, uh, see if we can get into this subject more. Now, you do know that the core value for March is new self-forgiveness. The forgiveness I received from God's concept of forgiveness and from repenting for closing my spirit with false substitutes, which gives me the compassion to keep my spirit open to others to cancel their debts, to release them from bondage, and to set them free to go. This is a very important subject, so I'm gonna break it down for us. There are five parts to new self-forgiveness. The first part is the forgiveness I receive from God's concept of forgiveness, not my concept, not my father or my mother, not my brother or my sister, not my preacher or, or anybody I hold in high esteem. Nobody trumps God. God is the only one who can give us his concept of forgiveness. And so the first part of new self-forgiveness is when you embrace and own God's concept of forgiveness. The second part is then you have to repent for closing your spirit with false substitutes. And there is a myriad of false substitutes, a litany of false substitutes that people use to justify not forgiving another person. So you have to repent from false substitutes. Then God will allow you to receive compassion from receiving his concept of forgiveness and that compassion to put yourself in the shoes of the person needing the forgiveness. That compassion will keep your spirit open to that person. Then you can cancel their debts. You can release them from bondage and then you can set them free to go. Now, it's important to understand that if you do not allow God's concept of forgiveness, the surplus from his spirit to flow into your human spirit, you will not have anything to forgive. In other words, before you can give forgiveness, before you can give an open spirit to another person, you got to open your spirit to God and let him give you his concept of forgiveness. Now we got a, a lot of ground to cover, so I'm gonna keep moving here. All right, so here's the passage we wanna look at. And I want you to give you, give you the context of this passage. Jesus is talking about the last days. 
He's talking about those things that will be signs of the last days, those things that will occur prior to the last days. And ladies and gentlemen, we are living in the latter times of the last days now. So you're gonna see a lot of resemblance in what's happening today and what Jesus was prophesying about and telling us that was gonna happen uh, uh, before the end would come. So he says in Matthew chapter 24, verse number 10, and then many shall be offended and shall betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because sin shall abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he that shall endure unto the end the same can be saved. And this is the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus is talking about shall be preached in all of the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. Now, this passage has a lot of prophetic things that we can relate to today. For example, here are seven signs in this passage. Number one, many people will be offended. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a time now where more people are offended than I've ever known. Our whole government is really being motivated by offenses toward one another. The uh, uh, parties that we have existed, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the Independent Party, the Conservative Party, there are a lot of people who are offended, ladies and gentlemen, and consequently, uh, we can't get things done in Congress because of the offense. Number two, Many will betray one another. There'll be a lot of people who will betray one another. This is happening not only uh, uh, in Congress, not only in government, but it's happening in churches. It's happening in families. It's happening in marital relationships. It's happening with father and son uh, relationship, mother and daughter relationships, parent and child relationships. I was saddened to hear uh, some of the things that was happening to Kirk Franklin and his oldest son. But I can tell you this, there are some things that we will say today that might help us to understand what is actually taking place when there is an estrangement that takes place between a father and a son, like in the situation with Kirk Franklin uh, and his older son. Then the Bible says, many will hate one another. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, offense leads to betrayals and then hatred. And the Bible says, many will hate one another in verse number 10. Then the Bible says, many will turn away from Jesus. That's what apostasy means. It means that I turn away from the living God and Jesus Christ, the son of God, who's the savior of the world. Many people will turn away. There will be a major apostasy. And then the Bible says, many will be deceived by others. And a lot of times we think that this deception occurs with preachers only or with elders or leaders in churches. Ladies and gentlemen, this is happening in Congress even as we speak. This is happening in government. There are so many conspiracy, conspiracy theories out here today that a lot of people are believing a lie and making it uh, 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 come to the conclusion that it's true. This is not on, on, on a form. This is not something that is, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? This was taught in the Bible. The Bible teaches us in the book of Thessalonians that there will be some who God will allow a strong delusion to come upon them. He will allow it to come upon them. Why? Because they believe a lie instead of the truth. Many people will be deceived and then sinfulness will abound. Many will increase into more sin, verse number 12. And then when we look at verse number 12, also, then the love of many will grow cold. Many people will stop loving and stop growing toward love. This is the climate. This is the environment that we're living in today. And this pandemic is just magnified it and increased it. So we have to understand, you got to know what to do to avoid the offense trap. So let's talk about that. Now, the Bible says in Proverbs 19, 11, a person's wisdom yields in patience. It is 
uh, to one's glory to overlook offenses. So in other words, you will be offended. Jesus said in John, or rather in Luke chapter 17, verse number one, it is impossible that the offenses will not come. But this passage is telling us you can handle offenses. And one of the things it's suggesting is sometimes you just gotta overlook the offense. We'll talk about that in more detail here now. So now, now there are three stages of the offense trap. Number one is called the bait. Number two is called the weight. And number three is called the break. Three stages of the offense trap that people get caught in. Let's talk about the first one. The first one is called the bait. Now, why is it called the bait? It's because the devil uses offenses as a bait to get people caught in the trap of offenses. It's kind of like putting worms on uh, a fishing rod, uh, the hook. It's designed to catch the fish. The devil uses offenses as a bait to get people caught up and offenses happen so easily. When someone offends you or hurt you, you have been given the bait. What's the bait about? The bait is about getting you caught up with the offense trap so he can ruin and wreck, uh, the devil can ruin and wreck your relationships with significant others in your life. Someone says, well, Brother Rhodes, how uh, uh, easy is that to happen? Jesus said it will happen and it's impossible if you are a human for you not to at some point in your life be offended. That offense is called the bait. Is when someone offends you or hurts you. Now, what is an offense? Why you cannot afford to be easily offended? Offense occurs when your spirit closes because you were offended, hurt, damaged, wounded, or wronged. It can happen so easily. That's why it's a bait. It can happen so easy in your life. Somebody can say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. You can feel disrespected or you can be respected or you can literally be wrong. But the bottom line is whenever you're offended, that's the bait. And the devil uses the bait to get control over you. And I was listening to the situation with Kirk Franklin and, 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 and his son. And it's so sad because this estrangement now has become publicized. I won't go into any detail about that because I'm not going to try to dissect, uh, dissect what happened with uh, Kirk Franklin and his son. But this is something that happens in a lot of people's lives. It happens because of some, some understandings that we got to get clear on in order for us to appreciate it. For example, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 11, when I was a child, I thought as a child. I understood as a child, but when I became an adult, I put away childish things. Now, let me show you how easy the situation can happen with a father and a son or a mother or a daughter or whatever. There's a concept in psychology called projective identification. Projective identification happens like this. So let's say, for example, I'm a six-year-old child and my father is not there for me. He is in and out. He's a truck driver or he's a person who's gone quite a bit. As a child, I conclude that my father will leave me. My father will abandon me. My father is not there for me. The same can apply to a mother. A mother could be leaving or have to leave. Or for some reason, a mother could have to leave for a real significant reason. And what happens is then the person uh, uh, will not be able to see them a lot. So they conclude that the person I love will always leave me. Now that's a child at six years old, or, or it could be a child at a very young age. Now what happens is in projective identification, the person who felt like the mother or the father abandoned them will project that on the mother and father when they become an adult. In other words, the same belief system that they had as a child, they project that on the parent as an adult. 
And when they project that on the parent, which was a conclusion of a false belief or could be a real belief that they had as a child, they project that onto the parent. That's called projective identification. Now, when the parent does not fit that image, that picture in their mind, when the parent does not uh, 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 show them that same picture in their mind, then that person who made a decision when they were a child will try to provoke them to abandon them. Why? Because they got this picture in their mind that the people I love will always project, always uh, uh, abandon me. And so consequently, now this projective identification will cause them to try to provoke the parent or provoke the other person who they feel abandoned them. And by the way, this person got an old self-love home base of abandonment. Then They'll project it on them. They'll try to provoke them to be it. And when they don't be it, they'll have a problem with them. And consequently, the offense trap catches them. And now they cannot have a close relationship. Why? Because of projective identification. They project it on the parent. The parent don't act like they want them to act. Then they try to provoke them to act like they want them to act. And when they don't act like they want them to act, they have a problem with them. And consequently, they close their spirit spirit, and they're caught in the offense trap. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but let me go on. Now, this offense trap is very devastating because when you are in the offense trap, according to Matthew 18, 25, that when you are in the offense trap, you and everybody in your family system goes to prison. In other words, they are the ones who suffer from it. The Bible says in Matthew 18, 25, you remember the, the man who had received forgiveness from God and then he did not forgive the man who owed him $20. He grabbed him by the throat and then he had him to be sent. The Bible says he ordered him to be sold into prison along with his wife and his children until he could pay the debt. What are you saying? He's in the offense trap. Okay, now, the second stage of the offense trap is called the weight. Now, the first stage is called the bait. The bait is what the devil uses to get you caught up in the offense trap, and he uses an offense when you get hurt, when you get damaged, when somebody wrongs you, or if you perceive that you're hurt or you conclude that you're hurt. Even as a child, you will project that on your parents when they are uh, 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 grown, and when you're grown, until you get out of the offense trap. But then the second one is called the weight. Now, the weight is when you close your spirit. See, first, the bait gets you. The weight is when you close your spirit. And you got to understand, you are a spirit. Now, here's a here is an area right here that I want to take the time to just clarify. When I don't know that I am a spirit, I have a soul and I live in a body, it causes me to misunderstand a lot of things. Number one, it causes me to misunderstand who I am. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. My spirit is real me. That's who I am. I am not merely a human being. I am a spiritual being. And because God created us as spiritual beings, Genesis chapter two, verse number seven, Genesis chapter one, verse 26 and 27, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's Jesus talking. And then the Bible says God created us a copy of himself in his own image. That word image means copy. So you gotta understand one of the key elements of forgiveness and unforgiveness is understanding that you are a spirit. Now, what? That's what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 through 22. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock at your spirit. That's your spirit. And, and if anyone will hear with the spirit my voice and open up, open your spirit, I will come into him. The Holy Spirit will come into him, commune with him, sup with him, and he with me. And, and the Bible says in verse number 22, in this context, he who have ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit is saying. So ladies and gentlemen, we got to understand that one of the major premises to 
help you to understand how to forgive and why people don't forgive is because a lot of people don't realize they are spirits and the spirit can close. That's called the weight. Here's an analogy of an open spirit. When your spirit is open, significant others can talk to you and communicate with you. The Holy Spirit can communicate with you. Love can come in. You can actually experience love. When your spirit is closed, it's the opposite. When your spirit is open, you can experience intimacy. You see, I cannot have intimacy with a person whose spirit is closed toward me, or if both of our spirits is closed, we can't have an intimate relationship because our spirits have to be open. When the spirit is open, the truth can reach you. The word can reach you. It all goes back to when you open or close your spirit. Now, let me go further. So what is a closed spirit? What is a closed spirit? A closed spirit is when your spirit closes due to some hurt or damage or an offense that bends you out of your original personality, out of your original character. And when your spirit closes, you literally stop being your original self and often you don't even know it. Whoa, now let's, let's, let's pause here for a moment. Now let's go back to the analogy of the young man or the young woman who at a child concluded that the parent will abuse them or the parent will reject them or the parent will abandon them or the parent will treat them uh, worthless and they have that conclusion as a child. Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child, I talked as a child. But when I became an adult, I cartagio, that's the Greek expression for I put away. Cartagio means I get rid of. Now I want you to also notice that it didn't talk about the youth stage of spiritual growth. If I conclude that the people I love will always abandon me, I cannot have a significant intimate relationship with that person until I cartagio, until I get put it off, until I grow up. So consequently, when we have a situation where this person is experiencing projective identification, they're projecting their picture of how the person should be as a child. And when that person is an adult, I'm talking about the person who was a child, now they're grown, they still will project that on that person. They will provoke them to be it. And when they don't be it, then they will have a problem with it. And it's all because of a closed spirit and the offense trap. I don't know if I'm making sense to you, but let me go further. Let me show you how delicate the spirit is. The spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a wounded spirit? Now let's go back to the six-year-old child. The six-year-old child is wounded. Father is a truck driver. He's gone all the time. So because he's gone all the time, the, the six-year-old child concludes that the people I love, especially my father, he will always abandon me. Now, this child grows up to be 36 years old, and guess what he does? He experiences projective identification. He projects on the father, you will always leave me. I can't trust you. I can't be close to you. You will abandon me. And then when the father don't do it, he'll provoke the father to try to make him do it. And when the father reacts to it and don't do it, then he'll create a problem with that picture in his mind of the father abandoning him. And he cannot have a significant relationship with the father nor can the father have a significant intimate relationship with the son. Why? Because his spirit is wounded. It closed and he concluded at a six-year-old child what his father would be. And now he's 36 years old and he can't be close to his father. I want y'all to see, I'm just using the illustration of the father and the son, but this can happen in all relationships. Let me show you how further how sensitive the spirit is. Proverbs 17, 22. the Bible says a merry heart, and y'all know the spirit lives in the heart, does good like medicine, but watch this now, but a broken spirit dries up the bone. So if I'm six years old, if I'm 10 years old and I get caught in the offense trap, I take the bait 
Now I'm experiencing the weight. My spirit is closed. I cannot have an intimate relationship with the other person because my spirit is waiting to be open again so I can have a significant intimate relationship with the person. And in some cases, ladies and gentlemen, this can go on throughout a whole person's life. They live and die with a closed spirit. Look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 13. A happy heart makes the face cheerful, but the heartache unchecked crushes the spirit. Now, let me tell you what also happens. If I am a spirit and I am a spiritual being, that affects my soul. My soul composites my mind and my heart. So a lot of things that's happening today, we got a lot of people who are having mental illnesses and mental challenges. Now I'm not talking about uh, biological uh, challenges. I'm not talking about chemical. I'm talking about literally erroneous, faulty beliefs that's been passed on from one generation to the next or from one uh, childhood stage to the adult stage. And now the person is offended because their spirit is closed. Let me go further. So let's look at this analogy of a closed spirit. Let's say, for example, I'm the six-year-old son uh, or six-year-old uh, daughter, and I have a significant other who's a father and a mother. The father or the mother who's significant to me tries to reach me, but they can't reach me because the spirit is closed. That black line represents the spirit closed. Now the Holy Spirit can't reach me, so I can't receive the forgiveness of God because my spirit is closed. Now that my spirit is closed, I'm in the offense trap. I can't experience love. God can't reach me. I cannot experience intimacy. Jesus can't reach me. The truth can't get to me. The word can't get to me. Why? Because I'm in the offense trap. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm trying to give us an understanding of what happens behind the scene. What can we say to the person who's six years old who makes a decision that their parent will abuse them. And in some cases they got abused or in some cases they were abandoned. The fact is once you get hurt, once you get wounded, the offense is the abate and the bait then causes you to wait until your spirit opens again. And if it stays closed, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot receive intimacy. You cannot receive love. You cannot have a significant relationship with the person. What are you saying, Dr. Roach? Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. But with all thy getting, get an understanding. I have seen situations where people have literally become mentally challenged because they did not understand what's going on behind the scene. And that's why it's important to have an analogy of a closed spirit. Now, let's go further. Here's some of the symptoms. When a person uh, has a closed spirit, they avoid love and intimacy. They, they will not be open. They're persistent in anger a lot of times. They're resistant. Uh, they're contrary. They uh, refuse to cooperate. They withdraw to themselves. They are unforgiving of others. They are disrespectful many times. And that's what Kirk Franklin was really dealing with. He was feeling like I was being disrespected by my son because he felt like his son was supposed to respect him. Well, his son's spirit may be closed. And as a result of that, he will reject, he will rebel, he will disengage, he will deny, he will blame, he will project, he'll isolate and he rationalize. Now, can you imagine a parent having to deal with that? What does the parent do? He can't do anything. Why? Because the projective identification has caused the child who now is an adult to project an image and a picture of who they should be and then provoke them to be it. And when they don't be it, they have a problem with it and they close their spirit, cuts the relationship. And that brings us to now the third stage of the offense trap. It's called the break. That's when you get bent out of your original character and you get stuck in your old self of abandonment, of abuse, of worthlessness, or uh, uh, rejection. Why? Because the break breaks you out of who you really are supposed to be. And here's the thing that's so um, devastating about this. Many times you can be in the offense trap and don't even know it. 
So who's going to be able to reach you? This is why we have to have divine intervention. And you come back uh, on on uh, uh, Thursday when we meet again, uh, and uh, uh, Tuesday when we meet again, and I'm going to share with you a way that you can break this 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 dilemma. Uh, it's called the miraculous forgiveness bar. You come back, we'll talk about that. But right now, let's look look at this break. Now, this break occurs because of an offense. Now, what we can understand, offense comes from that Greek word scandalon. It means a trap. It's a trigger of a trap. It's a trap stick, a snap stick. Now, let me give you an example of it. It's like when you go hunting, you can put the bait offense on the trap. And then the animal comes or whoever comes, and if they trick or activate the trap, then at that point, they get caught in the offense trap. Now, it comes from that uh, uh, Greek word, uh, camp to. It's a, a, a type of a bow. It, 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 it bends. It bends oneself. It means to bend something out of its original shape. So this second uh, aspect of offense is when you get bent out of your original shape. The metaphor is like a sapling tree. A sapling tree is the wood that they use to make bows and arrows. It's a red, soluble, Brazilian wood that comes from East India. It's a tree that easily bends, but if you bend it too much, it'll break in two. So it's good as a bow and arrow because it can bend enough for, for you to put the string on it and it's you can use the bow and arrow. But if you bend it too much, it'll break in two. So here's what we got. Offenses is a pain that snaps and bends you out of your original character. You're not yourself anymore. So can you imagine this child who made a conclusion at six years old, 10 years old, who still got this picture of the parent, uh, if you will, in their mind, projective identification, they project it on the parent, they provoke the parent to do it, and then they have a problem with the parent if they don't. Now, watch this. How does that affect the person's love life? How does that affect the person's relationship with others? Interestingly enough, there's a, a Mago uh, theory that says we literally will find somebody to marry who treats us like our parent treated us when we were a child. That's a whole nother subject matter there. But it's interesting how sometimes people will marry the person who their parents were when they were a child so that they can go back to the childhood experiences. That's what we call projective identification. And we then now can have a significant love relationship because we married the person who was our parent when we were a child. It's a whole lot of discussion there, but we don't have enough time. Okay, so how do you avoid the offense trap? You got to acknowledge when you are offended. There's no sense in the pretending like you're not offended when you're offended. It hurts to be offended. You can transcend offenses, but only if you acknowledge them and then you avoid them. That's what Proverbs chapter 19, verse number 11 says. It talks about how that you have to be wise when you're dealing with people who are offended or you are offended. Number two, you got to reckon yourself dead to offenses. In other words, you got to make sure that you don't let yourself get caught in uh, an offense and let your spirit close because the offense is the trap. The spirit closes is the weight. I mean, the offense is the bait. The uh, spirit closing waiting to be open again is the weight. And if you are a Christian, you got to remember what Paul says. You got to die to yourself. You don't have to be obsessed by offenses. You got to die to the offense. And then you got to be conscious enough to keep your spirit open so that you won't be responded to offenses that happen in your life. Then number three, you got to remind yourself that being offended is a choice. 
You don't have to be offended. One of the things that make you human is you can choose your own response to what happens to you in life. And that's what next month's core value is about. It's called new self uh, power, the power to choose my own response to what happens to me in life. I can choose not to be offended. Now, somebody says, well, Brother Rose, that's difficult. Yes, it is. You will be hurt. You will be offended. Jesus said that's impossible. But you have the power to choose whether or not you let that offense keep you caught in the offense trap. And then number four, you got to forgive the offender and keep your open, keep your spirit open to them. Forgiveness comes from the Greek word, which means to set free, to release, to pardon the prison, to release the person from their debt. Now, let me give you an illustration about this, how to avoid uh, 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 the offense trap. Proverbs 19, 11, a person who is wise will operate in patience. And if he's wise, he will overlook offenses. Sometimes you got to overlook the person who is caught in the offense trap because you can't change them. You can't make them change. If they are in the offense trap, they have taken the bait, they have been, they are in the experience in the way, and now they are experiencing the break and they are bent out of their original character and they are not themselves anymore. That's why you come back next week. I'm going to talk about the miraculous forgiveness bar because I have seen this power of the miraculous forgiveness bar to help people to get free from the offense trap. But let's take an example of one here and then I'll open up. This is a story about uh, David. You remember when uh, David and Goliath, you know the story of David and Goliath. Well, you remember David was taking care of the sheep and, and he heard this uncircumcised giant defying the living God. And when he came over to see what was going on, verse number 28, the Bible says, when Elab, David's older brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him. This dude had a closed spirit with, with uh, uh, a David because he showed up there. He said, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few little sheep in the wilderness? He misjudged his motive. Then he underplayed and played down his role as a shepherd. Then he went on. I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. Look at his spirit. It's closed. He said, you came down here to watch the battle. You're not even supposed to be here. Daddy told you to take care of the sheep. Why are you here? And David responded in verse number 29. Now, what have I done? Said David. Can I even speak about what's going on? And then the Bible says, he turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. Now, what he brought up was uh, King Saul had promised that whoever would kill this giant would be rewarded greatly and they could marry his daughter. So he then turns away from Elab, who was offended with him and trying to get him offended, and he avoided the offense. Let's look at four ways he did it. Okay, the first thing you got to do is you got to acknowledge to yourself when you are offended. There's no need of telling yourself that you're not offended when you are offended. You got to own it. David acknowledged his offense, but he avoided the fence trap. He acknowledged that his brother was a problem, but he avoided him and he turned away from him. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 29. Then you got to reckon yourself dead to offenses. In other words, you do not have to become obsessed with the person who is offended with you when you can't change them anyway, because if their spirit is closed, they've taken the bait, they are in the weight, and if their spirit stays closed long enough, then it breaks. So David uh, responds like this. David was offended. You know what he was saying to him hurt his feelings, but he did not allow the offense to consume his thinking and to take control of his behavior. He turned away from his older brother and went on to eventually uh, kill Goliath. Number three, you 
You got to remind yourself that being offended is a choice. You don't have to be offended. You choose to be offended. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not suggesting that you don't experience pain because it can be painful. But one of the things that you can do, you can choose your own response to the offense. David chose to not be offended and to react to his brother's accusations, to his brother's judgment against him. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 29 through 30, David overlooked the offenses and did not get preoccupied with it because had he done it, he would have took the bait, he would have had to deal with the weight, and ultimately he would have had to confront and deal with his own spirit in the break. And then finally, you got to be able to forgive your offender and keep your spirit open to them. David forgave Elab and he kept his spirit open to him, even though Elab was vindic vindictive, he was jealous, and he had a problem with David. Obviously, David did not take the bait. And that is one of the ways, the number one ways to avoid the offense trap. Well, now, how do you get things open? The key to open spirit is found in the word forgiveness. It means to release from jail, literally. It means to set free to go, and it means to untie the person from bondage. If you'll notice, everything about forgiveness is on you. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness is costly, but what you have to understand, forgiveness is not just for the other person. It is more for you. So when you release the person, when you set them free, when you untie them from bondage and let them go, you are doing the same thing for yourself. So forgiveness comes from the Greek word infinity. It means to send forth, let go, set free, give up the debt, keep no longer, permit to be free, hinder no more, bend back into shape. God's forgiveness snaps and bends you back to your original character, and now you can be yourself. The deceptive thing about it is when you are offended, you have taken the bait, your spirit closes, and it has to deal with the weight, and then if you don't open your spirit, it will break, and consequently, it'll kill any relationship that you may have, okay? We're going to stop right there and open up for some comments. Amen. I'm glad to see a number of you here. I didn't think that uh, some of you would be back, but we're thankful for you. If you came back, you got blessed with this lesson. Okay, let's take some comments. Here's Crystal. Crystal says, question. So are you saying that projective identification is basically the same as a person being so comfortable in their old self because that is what he or she is used to, and he or she actively creates situations to justify the old self-love states. That's almost what, what uh, uh, projective identification is. Think of it like this. Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child. Now, that's the way I think. I understood as a child. That's my comprehension. I spake as a child. Then he said, but when I became an adult, in other words, once I became an adult, what uh, identifies me being an adult? I put away childish things. The Greek expression, the Greek word for that expression, I put away, is called katargio. It means to get rid of. So you got to get rid of these pictures that you have in your old self as a child, and you grow up and operate in your new self. So you don't project the abandonment or the abuse or the worthlessness or, 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 or the rejection that you experience as a child on somebody that you have a relationship. And in most cases, it's the parent. That's what we was talking about, the situation with Kirk Franklin and his son. And then there are a lot of people chiming in on that. I don't want to get into that. I'm looking at what causes it, ladies and gentlemen. So basically, your comment, your question is, is ab absolutely correct. But what we got to understand is 
we don't necessarily get comfortable in the old self. The old self deceives us and we get stuck in the old self. And if I get stuck as a six year old in my old self with abuse, I'm gonna be treating people in my adulthood if I don't put it off with the same abuse. Amen. Okay, here's Cole, uh, Cora Percival. She said, bent out of shape and are not themselves anymore. This is powerful. Tell me more. That is a, a powerful concept. It comes from the Greek word scandalon. It means to, to it comes from the, that concept of the metaphor of a sapling tree. And the sapling tree is a bazillion tree and the wood can easily bend, but if you bend it too much, pop, it'll snap. So the, the offense is the, is the bait, okay? The uh, uh, closing of the spirit because of the bait, the offense, causes you then to be bent out of your original self. And if you're not careful, the break can take you out. And that's why you got some people who never get past their old self. And that's another reason why it's so important for us who are God's love bank family, us who are understanding this to help people to realize you got to put off the old self and put on the new or the old self will take you out, ladies and gentlemen, and ruin a lot of your relationships. All right. OK, let me get some more comments. Here. I'm trying to just take comments that people have. All right. Kathy says, thank you for this teaching, Brother Rose. Thank you, Kathy. OK, here's Crystal again. Crystal says, uh, there was a second part to that question. However, you answered it all in the lesson. OK, what is that second part, Crystal? If you want to get back to that, we will certainly talk about it. OK, let me see here. Uh, yeah, Cora had mentioned that. OK. There's a lot of people on here. There's Nicole. She says, amen. All right. We appreciate you, Nicole. OK, let's see if we can get some more comments here. There are a lot of people who are acknowledging they're on the show. Uh, so uh, I'm going to get wisdom, but with all that getting, get to understand it. Now, the reason that's important is because, see, a lot of what goes on with forgiveness is almost assumed by people that you can forgive just like that. But if you don't have an understanding about the offense trap, if you don't have an understanding about you are a spirit, if you don't understand that your spirit can close and your spirit can open, can you see how the devil can take advantage of people's lives? You see? All right, here's Crystal Smith again. She says, so we have to actively put off the old self by opening our spirit to begin the progressive healing of the soul so that he or she can learn to live in the new self. All in all, are you saying we have the power as spiritual adults to choose not to be offended? Absolutely. And you express that and, 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 and articulate that very well. See, the more I learn about my new self, which is I now, uh, uh, a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. My spirit is open. My soul can be open and my body can be open, but it all goes back to me understanding that I am a spirit. Then I can live in my new self and don't have to be in bondage to the old self. And that's why it's important for Christians, not only Christians, but everybody to understand you can have an open and closed spirit and don't even know it. Amen. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, my time is far spent. So I'm gonna stop right there. Thank you for being on the show. And by the way, thank you for uh, coming back. We had some technological difficulties again. I believe it's because of this message. I believe that the devil was trying to stop this message. So your coming back on the show is really a powerful testimony of you being a uh, uh, on with things. Sheree Johnson said, this is powerful teaching. Thank you, Sheree. And Kathy says, amen. Okay. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to close us out. Linda says, good evening. Take care, ladies and gentlemen. God be with you. <laughs>